right forward to the computer for this one. Oh, Amy, good to see you too. What a lovely group. So let me um, uh, welcome everybody. I'm glad to see we've got um, interest in this strand. Um, I'm, I'm going to kick off just by going through some information. But let me say, I'm definitely going to set aside a lot of time for Q&A. Um, and happy to talk through things specifically for your ideas or general questions as well. Um, Ahmed, my fearless partner in this endeavor, is on the line with us here as well. Ahmed actually helps to edit the Journal of Instructional, uh, uh, the <laughs> International Journal of Designs for Learning. I was getting the eye wrong. <laughs> um, which publishes design cases and has really been instrumental in um, bringing the idea of design cases from other design disciplines into instructional design and learning design. So one of the reasons I asked Ahmed to help me with this is he has supported authors, including myself, learn how to write design cases and is just one of the most lovely individuals to work with on that. So I'm excited. Yes, the only public publish only design cases. So <laughs> that's it. That's his specialty. So I'm going to jump into some information, but absolutely feel free to use the chat window to post questions as we go. Um, I, uh, and um, Sure. <laughs> Valerie, sorry. <laughs> Side question. And I'll monitor that. Um, I am i don't mind being interrupted at all, really. So let me jump into things here. So first of all, um, I, I'm just very excited about Otessa. If you haven't been to the uh, website yet, um, uh, conference details. This is going to be, um, I, I love the split on this. There will be an in-person uh, series of days from June 12 to June 15. And then we will have online days from uh, June 17 to 21. If anybody would like to do both, which I'm planning to do because I love Montreal. <laughs> um, then there's a day of travel in between for you to be able to get from one to the other. But if online is what works best for you, for whatever reasons, um, absolutely feel free to, you know, to participate in the online. We're going to make the ethics design showcase predominantly an online format so that it's really accessible and available to folks. Um, but uh, we'll do some things differently for the formats, of course, depending on modality. So that's not what I wanted to do. There we go. I'm going to start with the main Otessa theme this year, in part because all of this really dovetails in such a lovely way. So if you haven't read uh, the details about the main conference, the theme of it is sustaining shared futures. And the, the general gist of this is that, of course, we are all working on some rather significant challenges. And there are also some significant challenges facing us. And that invites a sense of shared responsibility as well. And I was just sharing with Valerie before, I love the framing on all of this because um, there's a real focus in the way that the message was crafted around this conference theme that is not just simply critiquing technology or its role or, or anything like that, but also starting to have that conversation of what can we do? Um, and I was talking about how this is reflective of, um, of a meta-modernist approach. And I love this quote that I feel like summarizes our theme. Yes, the planet is dying, but maybe we can do something. <laughs> so yeah, we have some big challenges that we are working on, but there are things that we can do. There are things that we are doing right through the everyday work that we do. And so the Ethics and Design Showcase is really intended to showcase design as a theory of action, um, that we are using or leveraging design as a way to try and tackle some of these very complex challenges that we're working on. Um, so it's about not only how we analyze um, or critique or identify the issues, but also 
how are we synthesizing all of that into solutions that we have to devise? We, it's not just simply a matter of uh, choosing A or B most of the time, but a lot of times we're having to craft path C to figure out, you know, how do we address a lot of the challenges that we run into? So I'll start with what is a design showcase? Um, and this is the, uh, Valerie put the link in there for the Otessa general call and you'll find a link to the ethics and design showcase in there. So design showcase focuses on actual designs. And this isn't re like a research presentation. Um, that's a common misunderstanding that I think uh, Ahmed and I tend to observe. Um, folks will submit something where they're studying a design or they're doing design-based research. This is not research writing or research uh, rhetoric. <laughs> and that is a surprisingly difficult shift for many of us to make, um, uh, you know, yours truly included. But I, I tend to think of this as this is starting to give us permission to talk as designers with other designers um, in, a, in a more designerly way. So a design showcase is gonna focus on actual designs uh, that could be designed artifacts if you have built a thing, uh, virtual, physical, or otherwise. Um, design systems, uh, I'm reviewing a, a design case right now that is a program that used ethics of care to redesign and reconceptualize our doctoral program. Really interesting design case. Um, designed experiences. So if you feel like systems or artifacts doesn't quite capture <laughs> what it is you're designing, maybe experiences is broad enough. This can also get into our design process or design processes and the various design tasks that we engage in, and of course, interactions that are very central to design. Um, so a lot of design cases will tend to feature the design team or the stakeholders or anybody else who's involved with or otherwise influencing that design process. And then we really want to see a discussion of how you as a designer or your design team navigated decisions and how you iterate it on those designs. <clears throat> so it's not just a summary of what you did. That's another issue that we tend to commonly see is a designer will start to just simply summarize, here's what we set out to do, here's what we design. Um, that's not that's not really the most interesting way to engage <laughs> on on the conversation. Um, so design showcases and design cases are really um, structured around how can you share your design knowledge. So I kind of like to think of this as um, a conference is a great way to think about it. Actually, if you're sitting around with a bunch of colleagues and you're swapping design stories the nature of what you're sharing in there is design knowledge. You're not just simply saying, you know, we had a this and we designed X. <laughs> you're gonna say, oh yeah, you know what? We ran into this issue. And because of that, we decided to do X or Y. And yeah, there's all these other issues or considerations, but but this is why we chose that path. Or, you know, we, we implemented this, but it, things didn't go quite as planned. And so what we learned from users was, X, Y, Z, and then based on that, we ended up modifying it in this direction. Those are the kinds of conversations that really start to facilitate exchange of design knowledge. And we're gonna, I'm gonna get more into design cases here in a little bit, <clears throat> but just to set the stage for what is a design showcase? What are we really looking for as part of this? So we have three options that we've created. <clears throat> the first are actual design cases. Um, and this is real, really where this started, which is why <laughs> you're hearing me emphasize design cases so much. But it's, a design case is gonna feature a design, but it's also going to highlight like tensions, decisions, iterations, and changes and reflections on that design. Um, Obviously for this strand, these design case, all of these should focus on some aspect of ethics and design. Now, the way that different designers approach that can really vary. 
Um, for some, they're focused on, on very specific ethical considerations, like um, we shared an example of designing accessible maker spaces. And one of the reasons I really like that example is because the designers, uh, well, first of all, accessibility in and of itself tends to get very simplistic uh, uh, treatments. But the designers do a lovely job of really unpacking in that design case how complex accessibility can be. So of course they set out to design this makerspace to be accessible, but what they quickly learned was that accessibility for one group conflicted with accessibility needs for another group. So that's a really significant tension that they had to navigate. So they talk about how they navigated that tension and, and what they came up with as a result, both in terms of the designed room itself, as well as implications for design process. Um, others may be using a particular perspective, uh, like uh, care or dignity or something like that in design. Um, like I shared the example of the PhD program that is redesigning the program um, to center an ethic of care. Uh, so you could take that sort of approach. Um, personally, like I tend to talk a lot about professional responsibility. So I tend to talk about duty, <laughs> responsibility, things like that. Um, or it could be unpacking a design or experience that on the surface may not seem like there are ethical issues or tensions to be navigated. But as you peel back the layers of that onion, you start to see um, the dimensions there that are actually uh, really important. Um, so we've got one in the hopper right now that I, I, I think kind of captures this where at the surface, it sounds like an, any, uh, any sort of design challenge that most of us work on. It's about designing um, information and instruction, whatnot for cyclists. Um, <clears throat> and this is in a Southeast Asian country. Um, but as they start to kind of peel back the layers, you start to see um, gender issues in particular and how things are designed, how it's conveyed, and so how they started redesigning um, aspects of what they were working on to address some of those considerations. <clears throat> So I would really love to see a, a robust set of design cases because I feel like this is where we really share our design knowledge with each other of how we tackle some of these complex issues. Conceptual papers are just exactly that. Um, here we've, we've framed this as reconceptualizing the design process, um, how we think about, how we represent or visualize, and how we talk about learning design work. We added this in because we were noticing a lot of conversation among folks of, around like, how do you integrate <clears throat> um, diversity, equity, and inclusive uh, considerations into instructional design or learning experience design, you know, or something like that, or gaming, uh, ga games for learning design. I was talking with one set of colleagues where that's what they're exploring. What does is, what is, um, games for learning design look like as you start to consider various ethical aspects and in interface design, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a space for more conceptualization of the work that we do. And maybe, maybe you're doing some work where you wanna advance a conceptual framework or, or something like that, or invite some sort of conversation. So we wanted to make sure we left room for that, uh, not just design cases. And then finally, we threw in this wild card. I don't know how many folks have ever considered this or read about this, but I wanted to make this a possibility just in case <laughs> somebody out there had a really great idea. <clears throat> so critical design is an approach where a designer uses the design process and a designed artifact to bring awareness to ethical issues and invite critical reflection on that. So in the call, we shared the example of the um, P-timer and the emphasis that that puts on workplace surveillance and uh, the impact of that on human physiology, human psychology, all of that. The purpose of a critical design, this is, this is a situation where you would actually design a thing. Um, and I note here, it could be absurdist, for example. I mean, the P-timer is certainly sort of an absurdist example. 
Um, but the aim of that is to raise questions through a design <clears throat> where you're inviting either deliberation of the design itself or a discussion on the nature of design or on the role and assumption of designers or you know some mix of all of those things. But this would be an actual designed thing. <clears throat> it could be a prototype or a representation of that, right? Like you wouldn't have to actually build a P-timer. <laughs> but the point here is that you would have a designed thing where whereby we can start to really question some of the underlying ethical considerations and other deliberations by way of discussing that design. <clears throat> okay. So for the Ethics and Design Showcase exhibits, for all three of these types, you'll be asked to prepare a short blog entry. Um, and I've given you an example here. Let me pull this up. Just pop this over here. <clears throat> so what I'm riffing on, or we're riffing on, the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian uh, Museum for Design. Um, they host design exhibits all the time. And a lot of their design exhibits tend to emphasize some theme that one could certainly um, cast as focusing on ethical considerations. For example, they just had one on dignity in healthcare um, and how you design healthcare environments to facilitate patient dignity in those environments. It's a lovely collection and book. This I loved. Um, I just love the story of the hijab emoji and like the underlying rationale for why um, this designer, Rayouf, decided to <clears throat> develop the hijab emoji. And as she goes through here, you can see it's not just about, you know, why she wanted that. And of course, it's about fundamentally about representation and identity. Um, but it also gets into some of the technical aspects that she had to navigate in order to develop the hijab emoji and a suite of those and how she worked with like the Unicode emoji subcommittee and stuff to get this developed. So it's a wonderful little story about um, the design process. And I think this is a good place to start. It's not a design case, but it's a really good place to start to start summarizing a design and sharing out some of that design knowledge. So we're going to ask designers <clears throat> to create a short blog entry. And that way we'll have a virtual exhibit with all of these different blog entries um, that will get posted and we'll support you in the spring on getting those posted and everything. Um, and then we're also, of course, gonna ask you to put together either an in-person or a virtual exhibit. Now here, I'm heavily drawing from markers of quality from Gray, uh, Colin Gray. Colin's another colleague um, at Indiana University who also works on the IJDL journal and has really led the way uh, along with Elizabeth Bowling and Craig Howard and others on design cases. Um, Colin wrote a great article on markers of quality for design cases, and I think you can use these for any of these uh, types that we talked about, where you want to address what aspect makes this particularly interesting to other designers, representations of the design as well. So that could be artifacts, illustrations, descriptions, uh, back of the napkin designs <laughs> or sketches, you know, whatever it is that you've got as an artifact that helps somebody else start to see and picture. Um, also including discussion of user experience and what extent does the treatment of the design convey a concrete understanding of what was designed. I really want to emphasize support and transparency and Hawkman, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass the baton to you here in a bit for whatever you want to emphasize too. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the things that we tend to see authors do, and I think we're trained this way because of research writing, is we tend to sanitize what we describe and what we summarize. Um, and I know when I first wrote my first design case, I was like, oh, here are the theories I was drawing from, and blah 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 blah, and that's great. That's certainly part of it, but 
the reviewers came back and said, I don't get a sense of you as a designer. I don't hear your voice. And I don't get a sense of like how your own background and experiences are really informing your design here. And I have to confess, it took me a while to like pause and really reflect and think about what was I drawing on for all of this? And once I started to unpack that and I wove that in, I was like, oh, now I feel this. And now I feel how it's more human, right? It's more transparent. It's not this sanitized story. So this in part gets into design failures, but I feel like this is also about unveiling your uh, your background and your experiences. So it connects a little bit with style as well. The tone here is definitely not a research article. I tend to think of this as more of like a, a scholarly conversation with other designers. It's not research reporting, but there should be a really clear point of view and it should be really clear who you are as a designer or how different members of the team were bringing in differing perspectives. And then in terms of scope, what we mean by scope is really, do you deal with the complexity of it? So again, sometimes we get design cases that tend to be really streamlined, you know, here's what, here's what our challenge was, what we wanted to do, here's what we did. And it doesn't unpack all of the really complex things that are taking place as part of the design process. So Ahmed, what would you like to add to all of that? Um, I don't know. I don't have much to add to, to be frank with you. Um, the idea of uh, support and transparency essentially at, at least from the genre of design case kind of require that you, the author, take an active voice in narrating what you have done, why you have done it that way, um, what moments of doubts, what you want to your mind when you're doing such design moves, and not necessarily try to kind of use learning theories or any kind of high <clears throat> instructional strategies or et cetera as a, like a shield to defend your design judgment. Um, essentially say, this is what I believe. This is how I did it. This is how I thought it would work. Um, it failed in this way. It was successful in that way. And here's uh, what I learned. Um, essentially, it's it's. I would describe it as almost like as a moment of stream of consciousness when you, the author, talk about your design judgments in a very authentic way without using that subject, that objective like um, language that we see in research paper, uh, like, or this has uh, has been designed, or this has been created, or this has been done by uh, this and this. Uh, go ahead, Valerie. See that you have your uh, your hand raised. Yeah, I love that. I just love that you mentioned failure there, and um, and made me just think for a second that sometimes the designs I have work for certain students better than others. Right. So it's, mm -hmm. it's even who did it fail for, you know, great for this group, not great for this group. How, like anytime we design, it's almost, it's hard to make it great for everybody um, in the same way. So anyway, I just want to um, mention and appreciate the mention of failure because um, yeah, anytime we iterate and change what we do, it's, it's not always, you know, a, a smooth ride. <laughs> it's good to share. Right. Thank you. I think in this too, oh, Brian, yeah, it's so funny you mentioned STS. I was just thinking of like Pinch and Biker <laughs> and like design variations and iterations and stuff. And how do we capture the more social and um, um, nonlinear nature of design and designed artifacts? So that's what we really want to endeavor to do in these. Um, and personally, I would share, I have really loved starting to develop this strand in my own writing and scholarship. Um, I was meeting with Colin last week on some other stuff, and I told him, I said, I feel like this has given me permission to talk like a designer and, and be a designer, like not just have the research hat on all of the time. Um, <clears throat> so 
I think if this is new to you, that's why Ahmed and I wanted to make sure we offered a lot of direct support. Um, and we'll be trying to offer um, uh, feedback and support as we go throughout the process too. Um, but if this is feeling kind of new and strange, um, you know, that you're 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 in the boat with a lot of us here. So I wanted to draw a little bit too then on like design cases and go into this a little bit and the idea of sharing design precedent. Elizabeth Bowling has really been, oh, I forgot the year there, but anyway, Elizabeth Bowling has really been instrumental in uh, uh, bringing into this, uh, this into the instructional and learning design field. Craig Howard and colleagues, I think that includes Elizabeth on there. And um, oh, anyway, a number of folks writing on that piece about um, bringing design precedent in. So I brought in this uh, example from architecture. Of course, this is from the Guggenheim Museum, which is such a lovely example of architecture. But this design cases start to treat design as a form of knowledge in and of itself. And that that knowledge is worth sharing, just like other forms of knowledge are worth sharing. Um, so this is also how other design fields tend to share their knowledge, like architecture. So if you look at the Guggenheim, like there's a lot of design thinking, of course, right, that goes into this, like why the spiral design, why the white, why, you know, all kinds of rationale. Um, and when architects talk with each other, they will share their experiences like designing with a particular material, you know, what, what was it like working with concrete versus quartz versus, you know, other, other kinds of ideas, right? Um, and all of that feeds into their decisions and they're constantly learning from each other by sharing that design knowledge. Um, so, I think, I think Elizabeth has done a great job, obviously convincing me um, and others that this is a really important additional form of knowledge for us to share. So I built in the examples or links to those articles here. And I think we've also got those in the CFP as well. But again, if, if design cases are new for you, I do actually really encourage you to at least read some of these referential materials and some of the examples that we've provided for you um, and and also not to feel like you've got to hit it right, um, right out of the bat, that uh, all of us have to kind of learn how to work in this new medium. <clears throat> so for ethics and design, and there's so many different ways you can think of this. Um, I draw a lot on Caroline Whitbeck's work where she refers to it ethics as design. Some folks use ethics by design. But here, of course, we want to focus on ethical issues that arise in design practice. There's so many different ways we can slice that, and we're very open to folks approaching it from a variety of different angles. Um, <clears throat> we're also viewing design here as a tool for devising solutions to the ethical dimensions of our work. So without being reductive about what design thinking is, this is really starting to fold in, you know, how do we use a design-based approach or a design mindset to try and tackle some of these issues where instead of approaching them as very simplistic binary options, you know, yes, no, on, off, A or B, that's not what usually happens most of the time in practice. Usually what happens, this is why I like, with Beck's work on ethics as design, is we're presented these dimensions just like we're presented other dimensions, learning needs, physical parameters, things like that. We have to figure out how to work within that. And based on all of these design parameters, what are the solutions or the solution set that we can derive from that? So this is really you know, focusing on how is design a tool for helping us devise possible solutions. And of course, that process requires navigating relationships, as well as differing values, interests, cultures, contextual factors, et cetera, that greatly influence both the process and the solutions. Those are some of those complexities that we're hoping folks will really get into. Um, we shared the example of um, empowerment for home healthcare workers as one of the examples in the call. I love that case because I, I know the lead designer in that one personally. And that was a tough one for her because her values as a designer really conflicted with some of the other stakeholders in that process. And she even wrestled early on with, you know, should I, should I even engage in this? 
Um, she wanted to design instruction that really empowered home health care workers in California. She's asked to design training for the state. Um, but there is legislation in the state that really emphasizes the rights and role and privilege of the home health care employer. <laughs> and so she kept running headlong into the language that she wanted to incorporate, the examples, the case studies that she wanted to design were creating some of these tensions. So that's a wonderful case where she and, and others working with her talk about how did they navigate a rather tension-filled tension instructional design project without nece her necessarily feeling like she forsook her own, for, forsake her own um, uh, values and interests, but she also needed to listen to others' interests and perspectives as well. So again, a lot of what we do isn't, isn't really the simplest, and that's what we're hoping you'll do is dive into some of these complexities here. Okay. Um, along with all of this, we've built out quite a few supports, resources, and examples. We tried to bake all of that into CFP, um, one, probably the world's longest CFP <laughs> with everything baked in there. Uh, early proposal deadline is December 20th. Oh, that's not 2024. That's 2023 <laughs> for the 2024 conference. For those proposals, what we want from you is which of the three options are you proposing? And then we'd like to have an abstract along with about 1,000 to 1,500 words that could potentially serve as your blog post. So there we're wanting to see you start to go into some of the detail of the design process or artifact, or if you're doing a conceptual paper, um, maybe you've got you know some diagrams for the framework or something like that, or visuals, and then an explanation of that. Um, for what your conceptual work would be. And then for critical design, that's going to look kind of like a design case where we would expect to see descriptions of the design, maybe some artifacts, things like that, as well as what are some of the issues that you are, are trying to prompt folks to deliberate. So uh, let's see. As well, I'll just note again, we have a related special issue of Otessa Journal. So after the conference, we'll invite accepted presenters to submit a full paper. So this is not just a conference proceeding, but we'll do an actual special issue of the Otessa Journal. Um, that's going to be targeted for late 2024, early 2025, depending on flow of things. But that would feature design cases, conceptual papers, and critical designs as well. Okay. Now that's it. Any questions? I'll stop sharing. We don't need to be staring at a screen that says questions. <laughs> yes, thank you, Valerie. Links in there. So the proposals go to the conference submission portal. And proceedings, those also go to the conference submission portal, um, and they can be added, you know, at a later date to the existing submission. Um, and then the journal submissions go to a different portal, just to make sure people understand that the journal has a separate home. Um, Brian, can you elaborate on your question about is there an open part to the design? What is that? What do you mean by that? Oh, just that uh, Otessa is the open technology conference. So do the designs have a specific open um, component to them? So like if it's a service design, is it a framework that other people can uh, take advantage of? Does well, it go um, beyond just regular uh, academic sharing? <laughs> Okay, that okay. Right, this sorry, that last part went a different direction in my mind. <laughs> so my brain suddenly went zoom. Um, and I'll I'll let Valerie chime in here on this. So I've always interpreted o Otessa, the open slash technology, to be really broad and inclusive. So while we um, certainly would welcome and encourage pieces that are on open, it doesn't have to be limited to that. In fact, I think a lot of the ethical issues that we navigate 
relate to systems and tools and and processes and whatnot that aren't actually entirely open. So I I would um, I would say it doesn't have to be limited to that. Uh, I, Valerie, is I, that I consistent? Can so open is just a piece of um, Otessa. Um, a, a lot of folks here have those values um, and practices, but we wanted to take down the silos of folks doing open go to a different forum than folks doing something maybe in a, in a closed LMS or some other type of way so we, we can be together. So anything broadly ed tech, um, but also inclusive of uh, the scholarship folks, so um, librarians and others. So, and also wanting to collapse the silos of research and practice. So um, it's not just researchers go to this conference and you know professional um, practitioners go to another. We we want to bring the research and practice together, and that's why we have research strands and practice strands in the conference sessions and even the journal. Um, and we also have added on a discourse section in the journal. So it could be, you know, kind of like a letter to the editor. <laughs> um, so you're welcome to um, yeah, to, to pick and choose how it works for you. And, and many people have multiple identities. So there are plenty of instructional designers who conduct research and plenty of researchers who you know, practice. So it's, um, you can participate in more than one option. Thank you. Yep. I don't know how to take the focus off of me. <laughs> Marina, go ahead. Um, this is really exciting, both of you. And I was excited to read the initial, um, ideas on the website as well. So I'm back channeling back and forth with some of my colleagues <laughs> as you were talking today. And my question actually kind of revolves around, we have so many people that would be involved in something that we would create. So mm. when we're putting in these proposals, um, it's, I, I, I haven't checked it, but is it, and Val, maybe you can chime in too, but is it like restricted to three people or how do you? I don't think so. No. So, so just, so we just started out, we get something going and then we say, knowing that this is going to be much bigger because of all of our team that we were, uh, yeah, I'm not, okay, you're looking, you're nodding your head. Yeah. Cause I'm like, this is by the 20th, we're like, yeah, you need. <laughs> A group has to get it started and then, you know, then we actually yeah. do it. Yeah. And I, and yeah, I go ahead, Ahmed. Yeah. No, I was, I was going to say, this is a, <clears throat> this is a, one of the FAQs that I, uh, because I am the, I'm the managing executive editor for IGDL, I, I get a lot of this question and my response has been consistent is that writing it, the design case, you list the author who contribute to, to the writing. Now, when it comes to the, the design itself, the creating, there's a section there, acknowledgement, and you can acknowledge the 100 people who have worked. Yeah. Uh, just because they haven't, in my opinion at least, just because they have contributed to the design to a certain extent, minor, medium, significant extent, I don't think that qualifies them to have an authorship on the design case. Okay. That's in my, at least in my opinion. Should they be acknowledged? Uh, for the absolutely and ethically speaking you want to ask them um, yeah. do you want to be acknowledged do you want your name to be on that mm -hmm. uh, some people say nope don't need to I don't really care about it some people like say yes please I want acknowledgement and those who wants to contribute to the writing um, to get a spot in the authorship list that's they have to contribute to the writing in my opinion um, there's yeah um, yeah and the reason my response at least is consistent because a design case, it's a different genre than genre than other um, published papers. Um, it is equally valid genre, even though they don't get cited as much as um, um, randomized control trials or systematic literature review. But if you do a systematic literature review on generative AI right now, your citation score is going to go up the roof, maybe. <laughs> uh, uh, 
you know, they don't get, but still, it's a very valid uh, scholarship genre. It's a it's a form of design knowledge. It's a scholarship at the end of the day. And even though it, it it's not written in, in the same tone and format other papers are, it doesn't mean it's less equally valid as, uh, of that. So that's why at least the authorship rules that apply to scholarship in a blank line, in my opinion, apply to uh, to writing design case. The only difference is the acknowledgement. You just have to acknowledge the people who, who, who worked at that. Yeah, actually, like really two weeks ago, I helped an author navigate that challenge. And my first was like, talk to the people. Ah, so it was like, well, some of them, they're not here working anymore. Find them, ghost them on LinkedIn, talk to them. I'm sorry. You have to talk to the people who work. I think I would add to Verena and for others who may be navigating this that trying to convey um, whose voice is speaking gets tricky with multiple authors, especially on a design case too. Um, that's another reason I really like that example of the design case on empowering home workers. Um, you might take a look at that and just see how Amber um, set that up at the very beginning around, okay, when I say, when I use this framing, this is me speaking with my voice. And when I use this framing, this is us speaking as more of a collective design voice. And so I really like there how she sets it up very clearly from the beginning about here are the different voices that you're going to hear. And here's how we're conveying those different voices throughout this process, too. So you might take a look at that and see if as, as you start to engage in the writing, that that also helps you in how you're crafting that and how you're clarifying, especially if you've got multiple perspectives that are going to start feeding into things. Thank you. That really helps. Um, I have a separate question because there's two possible topics. And that one's on a podcast series on um, instructional design and the equity inclusion problems and exactly that we're talking that you mentioned. So if you were doing a podcast, is it more I didn't quite see it in that design. So it's like describing how the process came about or how the podcast would come about. Same thing in simpler terms. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, in fact, what a what a neat thing to unpack, right? The design of a podcast or a podcast series. Yeah. I would anticipate that as part of that, you would start with like what were some of the motivating rationales and where did you start? But I would also anticipate you would start to talk about um, the issues that you started to notice and how you adapted um, the approach or what you were doing in some way in order to, to address like equity or diversity as part of that. And, and essentially you frame it from the very beginning that this is my ethical orientation toward the ideas of DEI and here's how we think about DEI and here's yeah. how I think DEI yeah. is important. And that prompted me to create something to that end. So this yeah. is, I think it's uh Ethics as design in this case, yeah. designing in this case as an out, and then you unpack the challenge and how to design it, etc. And that's where also there is a space for a stream of consciousness again uh, to say, mm -hmm. we just did it. We just talked to people and we just hit the record button and we did it. And we didn't, or you say we followed best practices. We actually looked at this resource on how to do that, or we talked to this person, etc. So yeah, it's kind of two layer, two or two, we heard two layer feedback from our audience and exactly you know, re yeah. reacted to that or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a two layer conversation about process, outcome, and the thinking behind these these two. So maybe three in this case. <laughs> three, <laughs> three layers. Thank you. I won't keep you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Valerie. You have a question? Oh yeah, I see your hand raising. Just thought I'd mention the other ethics, uh, human research ethics boards on campuses. Um, when we've had practice article submissions with the Otessa Journal or even the um, Otessa Proceedings, things that are coming out, sometimes uh, folks will include student data in some way and, and kind of think, well, it's, it's fine, I don't need you know, ethics, because it's for practice, um, but it's a scholarship of teaching and learning piece. And it's still, so just to 
just so folks don't go down a, a pathway where they haven't considered ethics in their submission if they are thinking of including um, student resources or artifacts that they should handle that with care and yeah. you know don't hesitate to reach out to um, uh, Stephanie or Ahmed um, first um, and uh, or check in with your ethics and get a waiver um, because some of the submissions would be like, oh, I don't need ethics was what they wrote in, I think, on the, you know, uh, declaration on the submission. Uh, but we, we need to have a waiver, you know, to because <laughs> uh, some of those actually did need ethics. Uh, so just wanted to bring that up so we can, um, yeah, co make sure that's covered before you get into it. Thank you. Okay, other questions that folks have or things that you're considering and you'd really like our thoughts on those for you. We're still in spotlight mode <laughs> and I don't know how to change that. <laughs> so I can't see everybody who's on the call here. Uh, you, okay. There is like a view button on the right corner uh, oh there there like a, there yes yeah, thank you yeah there perfect oh good okay. happy ha happy to be your zoom technical support at any time. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> i forgot it was up there to the session types um sure so the way that we're going to set this up is is going to be more like a a large um i i would think of this as really like uh, a poster session. Um, so we'll have a 60 minute session dedicated to the ethics and design showcase. And the way that we're envisioning this is that either in person or virtually, you would be able to go around and see different exhibits. Um, so again, we're thinking of this as like a, a conversation or marketplace of ideas, right? So if you're gonna be presenting during that time, I think you want to be thinking about um, having multiple people come through throughout that time. So it wouldn't just be a 60 minute presentation, right? But how can you convey the sense of your design? What might you share with folks as well um, that they could take a takeaway with them uh, in order to, to learn more about that? But you're going to you're going to want to give kind of a shorter spiel on things, right? Uh, you know, maybe aim for about a 10 to 15 minutes at most, assuming folks are going to circulate. And then also definitely assume time for questions and conversation around your design, uh, either with just one-on-one -on -one or small group. Again, I think the poster sort of approach is a really good analogy for what that would look like. In addition, though, what we want, like I said, we're, we want to sort of create an archive of the design. So I'm really drawing here on the Cooper Hewitt uh, Smithsonian uh, Museum and how they pull some ideas together there. So even when they do like an in-person or a virtual exhibit, they also have these stories and these posts that go along with it so that they create a digital archive of um, all of these design exhibits. So that's why we're also going to be asking you to put together about a 1,000 to 1,500 word, you know, it doesn't have to be super long. This isn't the article itself, um, but like that one that I showed you on the hijab emoji, we want to pull all of that together into a digital archive so that we're bringing together any of those that are presented in person alongside those that are presented virtually so that what we're doing is creating this repository over time of examples. Like that's how we facilitate this design knowledge, right? So, you know, over time, like I'm really fascinated to look not just at individual pieces, but start to look across these and really try and better understand how are designers incorporating this? What are they thinking about? What are what solutions are they generating? You know, what can I fold into my own process as well? So we're we're really going to be curating all of that digitally as well. Um, for the conceptual papers, I think exact same thing. Think of this as like a poster 
sort of presentation where you're going to have time uh, to, to talk about it, but you're probably going to have folks coming in and out and you may give that same talk <laughs> a few times um, throughout that time. And so what can you share on that, like a brief paper, what are visuals, how might you put that together? And of course, same thing for the critical designs as well. So like Brian, if you're considering doing that, I would, I would anticipate seeing like, the actual design itself, maybe even some prompting questions around this. Um, for that, I would really, I might even pause and think about how novel this is for others and how how are you going to facilitate bringing others into the conversation? Um, you might also have some ideas that we haven't thought of. So Ahmed and I are, are very open. Um, I mean, you guys are designers too. <laughs> <laughs> so we're very open to things uh, that you might imagine or approaches that you might imagine as this, especially for something that's an inaugural um, strand like this. This is a great opportunity for us to imagine along with you and iterate, you know, the design of this too. So if you've got other ideas that you're like, hey, I think I'd really like to take this approach to how I present in this time, you know, with keeping in mind some of the, the parameters of that. Um, let us know, and we're happy to talk through that with you and figure out, okay, how do we support that either physically and uh, on site or virtually or whatnot and, and see what we can help you do. So that was, that was a really broad, but did that help answer your question, Amy? Yeah, it did. Thank you. And I believe we're having the session, two sessions, one on the on-site day and one on the online day, so because yep. the first four days of the conference are on-site, and we have a gap day for travel, and then we have the five part-time days um, fully online. But we will, we piloted the internet radio last year, and we'll be seeking to have audio streams uh, from the on-site sessions to yeah, make it more permeable in addition to the blog posts for all. <laughs> Okay, other questions or anything else we can help clarify at this stage? Okay, so following this, um, we'll have the stage for proposals. As I noted, feel free to reach out to me or Ahmed or both of us. Um, and we are, we are delighted to help folks um, develop your proposals or give you feedback. After that, once we receive things, we are going to have an additional support session for getting ready for the conference. Um, at that point, we should have more technical details on uh, where things are going to go, how we're going to do X, where to upload, you, you know, your blog post, all of all of that good stuff. Um, and uh, I, I anticipate we may also... Um, uh, I'm, I'm editorializing here, Ahmed. Um, <laughs> when, when what I've seen is when authors tend to submit design cases because this is so new, there are times that we also look at something and we say, um, "Okay, we see where you're headed. You're having trouble making transition to the format, which is totally understandable. So we're going to support you through that process. So we may work more closely." with authors. Again, this is one thing I've really valued about Ahmed as a colleague um, in supporting some of my own work as well. So we want to bring that out to everybody as well. So if we get some proposals where we can we can tell it's it's like headed in that direction, but not quite there yet. Um, we will also reach out and actually work with folks to make sure we're helping to nurture that in the right direction. So well, thank you very thank you for the kind words, um, Valerie and Verena. Verena, I hope <laughs> I get to meet you in person. <laughs> so that would be lovely. Um, the, um, the acceptance yes, rate ahead. the acceptance rate at IJDL is ranges between our cumulative acceptance rate since we have uh, started publications in two thousand ten. So it's uh, IJDL is a 50, uh, thirteen years old. Uh, middle school or maybe almost high school or um, <laughs> so um, it's between 58 uh, 
percent and sixty eight and sixty percent. So let's say I think it's it's yep. close to sixty percent, and that's a high acceptance rate uh, compared to other ACT sponsored journal, Journal of Computer Higher Education, for compared example. Compared to so, us, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. compared <laughs> compared to uh, J uh, JC. I'm not going to cite our statistic compared to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to Italy, and and the number like wow, the journal is like. And I'm like, no, we are actually very selective. And the reason is that our acceptance is so high are two. First, we publish only design cases. Um, that's it. We don't get any, get any other genre. Um, we get submission like, oh, this case study. We're like, uh, no, sorry. <laughs> and But we, the second reason is that actually we don't say no, sorry, is our default choice. Unless it's extremely obvious, like a person is basically just submitted didn't read the journal, didn't even bother to look at the guidelines, et cetera. Yeah. You know, that's kind of almost automatic now. But we actually have a very developmental process at IGDL, like uh, Stephanie mentioned, in the sense that uh, someone can submit to IGDL and get two rounds of review just before the desk accept reject. Two rounds of review by the editor. Um, so I'm saying that to what to self advertising for IGDL? No, absolutely. <laughs> it's basically to say, uh, my promise is I will bring that process here, working with Stephanie. And I know Stephanie is committed to it. That's my promise to you and to Otessa. We'll bring that developmental process and say, okay, not quite. Here's how we can help you to get there. Here's how we help you to trim all that. Uh, uh, oh, we did research and we did data. Okay, they're just trim that up and let's focus on what you design. Let's focus on the lesson or the model that you have designed or that interactive game that you have designed or whatever you have done. Um, and the, and so that's the first promise. And the second thing that I want to say is that this could be an opportunity if some of you are mentor graduate students or have graduate students to bring them along the journey to master early on um, writing design cases as they are being trained to write scholarly journal articles for different venues, this could be an opportunity for graduate students also to learn how to do that for design cases. So please point. help, yeah. So please help us spread the innovation, spread the uh, <laughs> spread the journal by basically starting them early. It's like uh, language development. If you wanna teach a language, although it's not scientifically proven, but I think it's a common, uh, it's a common wisdom. If you wanna teach a language, start early. Yeah. <laughs> Karen? Um, I have a question actually specific to game design. Um, I have a project in the works that is a procedural rhetoric uh, experiment that manifests as a game design, but it's very much only going to manifest as a prototype and it exists to provoke discussion about educational design and, and how we approach uh, our design choices. Is it okay to uh, pitch something that will not be complete, that it is like a functional um, an MVP. section of a game as, as a prototype? A, a minimal viable case? product, maybe. MVP. Yeah. MVP. Yeah. I, yeah, I think it's fine, in my opinion. What do you think, Stephanie? Yeah, yeah, no. Well, it sounds to me like it's not, the emphasis here isn't so much on finalizing a product that you would yeah. move out like to to diffusion but rather how you're using it instructionally right mm -hmm. yeah that's it's, really it's a it's a writing experiment and a thought experiment um, okay yeah so, so it would be more under a bit of a wild card or a bit of an instructional design category I think we do that all the time in learning design right like I'm thinking about an engineering class that I taught where we designed a simulation that the point of it wasn't to finalize the simulation and we and we revised that simulation over time right as we discovered oh it the way we designed it prompted x and the students we needed we needed to kind of adjust here or tweak there or whatever right so what it eventually looked like in the class was was something completely different i mean that's a design even if it's not an artifact that somehow becomes like external to you and your team. And I think that's, it's really fascinating to situate that in that context, right? Like how are we designing something like that for instructional purposes? Mm -hmm. And I think that that actually helps with some of our conversations that we need to have around how are we, how are we teaching this stuff? 
too. Um, so no, I think that's really fascinating and I, that would be wholly appropriate. So I might flesh that out a bit then. <laughs> now or in the future. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Ahmed. Bye. Yeah, that'll be, that's going to be really exciting for our Tessa journal. So be great to see how that goes. So folks, I don't want to, um, I know we set time aside, but it was just for me to be available for your, for, or and Ackman and I to be available for any questions. Um, uh, I don't feel like we have to stay on. If you've still, if, if you do have questions, let me know. If you have a question arise later, uh, like we've said, absolutely feel free to email us. Um, we're, we love doing this. Uh, I hope our, our passion for this is coming through as well. So um, it's a real joy and we look forward to working forward with folks. So um, let us know. Otherwise, I'll hang on a few minutes if folks have other questions um, and otherwise have a great week. <laughs>